Love too has to be learned. This is a quote taken out of Nietzsche's 1882 book, The Gay Science. But isn't love instinctual? What about love at first sight? And how in the world does someone learn how to love? These are some questions we would be investigating and answering in this short video. But first things first, let's take a look at the author before going further. Over the years, Friedrich Nietzsche's study of human life and dealings has been both critiqued and examined thousands of times. There are a lot of things that can be said about Nietzsche. But the most appearing teaching to be gleaned is probably that of cynicism. But the cynicism of Nietzsche was not just mindless critique of modern concepts. In fact, he appreciated the human condition. He did not make light of even the concepts he was critiquing. Since Nietzsche's philosophy covers almost all human conditions, sufferings and peak experiences, he delved into the idea of love as well. Or loving, to be more exact. Love too has to be learned. But first, let's take a look at love itself. Nietzsche claimed multiple times throughout his work that love, as was experienced by humans, was simply a result of human egoism. The things people call love may be the most ingenuous expression of egoism. Suffice to say, Nietzsche did not agree with the idea of love being selfless. It is, however, very interesting to see how he conceptualized love. For one, Nietzsche was not really opposed to the selfishness experienced in love. Rather, he made no attempts to challenge the human drive to love. Suffering was an inevitable end to almost every way humans deal with anything. Thus, suffering itself does not tell if the act which led to it was right or wrong. In fact, Nietzsche compared the feeling of love to greed, as both greed and love drove individuals to possess things. Why would anyone really approve of humans just being possessive? Isn't the fact that Nietzsche was partially supportive of such possessiveness kind of screwed up? Perhaps it is, if we don't look at the nuance. Let's first take an example of Robert Henry, one of the greatest American painters of all time. Having studied in a place where art was changing and deconstructed, he revolved against American academic art. He founded the Ashkent School of American Realism with a small group of dedicated followers, portraying urban life in an unrelentingly brutalist manner. Suffice to say, this appreciation of art was manifold, and this appreciation is what he linked with love. Art appreciation, like love, cannot be done by proxy. It is a very personal affair and is necessary to each individual. As a budding artist, Henry was influenced by many of his mentors. Gradually, he developed a more nuanced appreciation of art, which isn't out of the blue when compared to artists who genuinely appreciate art. Aside from his own paintings, this passion was also reflected in his lectures. Henry's painting lessons were so motivating that when Marjorie Ryerson, an artist and a former student of Henry, asked him to publish her lecture notes, he readily consented. And hence, in 1923, The Art Spirit was published. The reason why we referenced Henry in an analysis of Nietzsche is the similarity of appreciation. Love, like appreciation, has to be a very personal thing. Otherwise, how could we really give it any value? Perhaps what Nietzsche meant was not the love as thought in popular culture, but a much deeper component, a much deeper element which ties into how valuable an object or thing is for us. In fact, it might very well could be. Let's take a look at the first half of this Nietzsche quote. One must learn to love. This is what happens to us in music, First, one has to learn to hear a figure and melody at all, to detect and distinguish it, to isolate it and delimit it as a separate life. Thus, the first step towards loving is to pay close attention to the object or the person. What is it about it which makes me feel some way? Nietzsche then continues, 
Then, it requires some exertion and goodwill to tolerate it in spite of its strangeness, to be patient with its appearance and expression, and kind-hearted about its oddity. The next step is to understand and accept. But acceptance is not limited to just the things you like, but of what makes it different than almost everything else. There is a certain uniqueness to almost every person or art piece there is. Thus, to like it for its uniqueness is the second part of learning to love. Then, Nietzsche moves towards the final stage. Finally, there comes a moment when we are used to it, when we wait for it, when we sense that we should miss it if it were missing, and now it continues to compel and enchant us relentlessly until we have become its humble and enraptured lovers who desire nothing better from the world than it and only it. We need to have time spent on it to appreciate something. Think about how people fall in love with their families, or their houses, or even their lovers. They spend time in their or its company. In essence, Nietzsche deconstructs the process of loving into stages. Each of these stages calls for deeper attention to the object of love. One could even form questions to check if someone truly is in love. Do I know what I like about them? Do I know what makes them unique? Do I accept their uniqueness? Do I want to be in their company? Do I miss them if they are not there? The beauty of this excerpt from Nietzsche's work is that it can be applied anywhere. You could love an individual, an art form, a building, a group of people. But all of them pass through these necessary questions before you can say you love them. So, the next time we end up loving something or someone, we could ask ourselves a lot of things. Perhaps then we will appreciate love even more.